right? <laughs> you can't remember. Yeah. It's too many short courses, too many photos. Um, he is a facilitator. She does a little bit facilitate, different facilitation than some of the things we've been talking about, so it's great that she can talk about her diversity of work and maybe some of you know, what she knew coming into the short course and anything she may have been thinking a little bit differently about now. She's also the president of IAP2. You all might remember the IAP2 spectrum we showed you earlier, so the International Association for Public Participation. We've got deep expertise in public participation, so maybe if you have questions about that side of, kind of acting collaboratively, you can ask her. But with that, I'm gonna let her tell you a bit more about her and her work, and we'll have plenty of time for questions and discussion. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm really pleased to be here. Um, it's really intimidating to stand up here and talk about collaboration and facilitation because I don't consider myself an expert in either of those things. Um, I consider myself an expert in public participation. So uh, I'm gonna try to draw some parallels to the work that you're doing in this course to the work that I do regularly. And hopefully, um, I'll talk a lot about public participation. A lot of the things you're learning, like the reframing discussion that you're having this morning, um, absolutely fit in. I'm sure Diane has also shared with you some stories from public participation. Uh, Diane is a colleague of mine. So uh, hopefully I can make those parallels, but if I'm not, please let me know um, because big C collaboration and little c collaboration and public engagement and public information, public involvement, and all of these terms kind of blend together um, and they basically lead to these perceptions that Michelle was talking about as to whether people want to get involved in a process, whatever that process looks like. So um, a little bit about me. Let me start my timer here so I don't. Uh, I'm a firm called Summers Hermione Associates. We are public participation specialists. That's all we do. Um, there are a lot of folks who work in the public involvement arena in Salt Lake or in Utah, and they come from a variety of different places. So that can be an engineering firm, it can be a collaboration firm, it can be a public relations firm. There are a handful of firms like mine. Um, and we really strive to build a different idea of consensus and ensure that participants have the opportunity to get engaged. So really my primary focus is helping people get involved in decisions that affect them. I'm going to talk about IUP2 in a minute because it is how I've based my entire practice um, and it runs across the, the work that we do. Um, but really, primarily my goal is to help um, owners, decision makers, whatever you want to call them, figure out who they need to be talking to, what the opportunities are for the public to weigh in, um, help build trust and credibility through that transparency of having those conversations, building relationships. Um, another part of that is educating the public about the processes and frameworks in which we're working, right? Um, it's not a, like a public relations scheme where we don't want to talk about those things. We need to help the public understand the way that decisions get made in our government because that's what we're here for, right? Um, a lot of the processes that I work in, in public participation are government funded. They're, they're funded on tax dollars. And so to be transparent and build credibility, we need the public to understand what we're doing with their money and why. Um, and that we need to respectfully consider public input. And this is really important to me um, I'll talk a little bit more about myself as a person, but uh, public involvement has this kind of, I don't even know, I want to say it's, it's kind of huggy, uh, there's it's a little woo-woo, people kind of are like, oh, just go tell them something, or I don't want to talk about it, right? It kind of depends on the arena in which you work. I work primarily in transportation, and I work primarily with contractors, so there are a lot of words I can't say about how they want to talk to the public. Um, <laughs> But the public knows things that we don't know, right? They have different perceptions about things that we, than we do. As technical experts, we understand something in great detail, um, but we don't necessarily live it. And so the people who we're affecting with whatever our project is can tell us things that we might not have considered. Uh, in a, from a transportation perspective, that could be, um, you know, my designers will look at a, an irrigation system that they have to move because the road is being widened. And hydrologically speaking, from an engineering perspective, everything should work, right? Water flows downhill, they've put the boxes back, 
and uh, you know a 70 year old resident who's been using that irrigation to water their historic trees that came across the plains or you know whatever they are um, is telling us that it doesn't work and it, because it's different or because it doesn't meet a need that they have and so respectfully considering that public input making sure that we understand not just that somebody has an opinion but what it is and where it's coming from going back to that reframing question understanding the motive uh, motivation behind it uh, is really critical to me and then finally um, and this you'll see is directly an IAP2 thing but letting people know what we do with the information that they give us right I think there to me there is almost nothing more infuriating than hearing thank you for your comment right it, that literally means to me that you're gonna just throw it away like what was the point of me sharing my, my input with you if you're not going to do anything with it so um, this is kind of the framework in which I work, and that comes, uh, a lot of it, from IAP2 USA. I arrived at this work in public participation, like many of my colleagues, from a side tangent. Um, public participation doesn't really have a clear educational track. Um, I came from communication. I did my graduate work here at the U um, in public relations and organizational communication. Uh, with a focus in environmental communication, so somehow I still ended up working in roads. Um, but I found IEP2 right out of grad school, and I was so pleased because I felt like I'd found my people. Um, and then I got suckered in, and now I'm the president. So I've been <laughs> since 2007, and I've been on the US board for six years. <laughs> Uh, and I will say the reason that I have become a member and, and become a leader in the organization is that while I have my specific niche in public participation, transportation is a huge driver of public engagement, participation, whatever you want to call it. And I think that's because it touches people every day, right? You have to move to do the things that you need to do in your in your day to day life. Um, but there are folks like. Donya and Michelle who are doing you know, long process that touches on this. There are people who are doing um, energy that I get to learn from. So this organization has provided me with a lot of insight into a lot of different fields, even though in Utah primarily transportation is the driver of public engagement. So um, I'm sure you saw the core values. I know we talk about it in, in the course. To me, um, this is sort of like the foundation of democracy in my mind, right? Public Our government is based on this idea that the public has something to say and that our government should represent that in some way. So if I'm thinking about a government project, I'm thinking about how are we gonna tell people what they're doing, what we're doing? Um, how do they get to have a say? Um, are we making sure we're talking to the right people? Did we miss people? Um, how are we using their information and what are we telling them about it? And I'll get to some examples here. Um, and then the spectrum, which I'm sure you guys have talked about also, but this, I think, the bottom half of the spectrum is actually the most important part to me because what it's saying is, here's our process and here's how we're going to work with you. So. Um, that doesn't mean that informing people is necessarily wrong. Sometimes you just need to tell people what you're doing, but other times you need to make opportunities for them to get engaged. So most of the time when I'm looking at the spectrum or when I'm working with teams, we're, we're, we're operating under a number of these um, columns over the course of time. So at some point we might involve the public to look at specific issues. At other points we might just tell people what we're doing about it. Um, there may be certain decisions where we can em empower them, and, and that is a free box, right? But in government, it's really important to tell people when those decisions can be made broadly and when they need to fit within whatever your box is. So that's really what I do. Um, here's a news story that ran yesterday. Um, like I said, I work primarily in transportation, so I get to do really cool stuff like talk about moving the third largest bridge beams in this country. <laughs> <laughs> They're the biggest in the state though, so that's kind of exciting. Uh, I, like I said, we do 
I get to work with great PR people who get to do really cool, fun things. This was a door claim that we put up in a movie theater, and we did a movie trailer to tell people about lane configuration changes. Sometimes my job is standing in the field talking to a property owner about why we just dug a tenth of trench through their driveway. Um, other times it's facilitating really traditional process like open houses. Um, I tend to not go door to door as often anymore, but I tend to get the, one, the folks who are the most hot now. That's kind of how my practice has evolved. So I have staff who get to do the easy stuff and I take the hard ones. Um, and we determine that by using an assessment tool that's very similar to the assessment that you're doing. Although in public participation, particularly with UDOT work, um, I'm not going out to a bunch of different key level stakeholders to ask their opinions in advance. What I'm doing is looking at the impact of the potential project and figuring out who we need to be talking to and why. Um, so I might send my staff out to just talk to the general managers of some businesses, and I will personally go and talk to people who are really, really, really going to be impacted. Um, so we have a broad range of things that we do at my firm and that I get to do. Um, it's really a lot of fun because, uh, which is, like I say, it's super weird that I started in environmental communication because now we build roads, which is like the opposite. Um, I never thought I would learn this much about civil engineering. Um, and that's a really fun thing about public participation is because the process is, is the same across the topics, you get to learn a lot of different things from um, subject matter experts. And that's one of the things that I really enjoy about facilitating those processes is that I don't have to be an expert on anything. My job is to connect people to people. And I think that's the same whether you're talking about public engagement on the ground in front of somebody's house, or you're talking about a big C collaborative process, right? You are getting information to people so that they can hear it from each other to figure out how to move forward together. You know, the balance is a little bit offset on a UDOT project, right? UDOT will do the work that UDOT needs to do, regardless. Um, so that's, you know, where public involvement is different. And some of your agencies and entities are the same, right? You have your mission and your vision and your budgets and your things that you are doing. Um, but there are certainly ways to help streamline that, to help work with the public, to help reduce conflict. Um, and that's really a lot of what we do. So I was asked to talk to you about, uh, oh, sorry, <coughs> one other thing. Um, so after about 10 years of working in public engagement, I also started doing what that we call partnering, which is kind of collaboration it's kind of team building, it's a little bit of facilitate, well, it's mostly facilitation because I'm kind of helping walk people through a process. So, um, engineers love partnering, by the way. <laughs> uh, this is one of my favorite um, partnering activities. Has anybody seen the book called Zoom? Do you know of this book? Oh, it's great. So, um, the book Zoom is just a picture book. And uh, the, the activity, you take the pages out of the book and you give it to the group and you, they are only allowed to look at their own picture, but they can communicate what is on their picture to the other people in their group and then they have to get themselves in order. And I'm not going to tell you any more about it because the pictures are, it's not exactly what you think it will be, right? And so it takes a group of really technical people quite a long time to figure out how to do this. And one of the reasons that I like it is that you see quickly who becomes a leader, who becomes frustrated with uh, miscommunication or lack of communication, uh, and typically those are the people who will take charge. Um, you can see what people do when they are faced with something that they don't feel very strong as a skill for themselves. Um, and you can see that kind of, you know, you've got some hands out like this. You've got a, so I think on the top left, they're actually showing each other their pictures now because they've figured it out. Um, I had one group who literally argued, I told them not to show their pictures to each other. And then at the end, when we were done and I wanted them to show their pictures to each other, they started arguing with me about it <laughs> because I had told them not to show their pictures, right? Um, so you'll see who's a rule follower. Um, it's a really great teaming activity and it's a fun one to get people started because you start to see that human dynamic, which to me is super critical no matter what group you're working in. 
Um, so this is a kind of a fun piece of facilitation that I get to do now in the same line with my technical groups. Um, I'm going to show you something that's a little bit woo-woo. Uh, have any of you done strengths finders? Okay, so I love strengths finders because it is a positive way to look at people. So strengths finders is a personality test. It's like the Myers-Briggs INTP stuff. There's many, many personality tests. We do another one called DISC um, on a project team. But strengths finders I like because there are 32 strengths, everybody has them, and they're all in different orders. So what that's saying is there's not a thing that you're not good at. The reason that I'm talking to you about my strengths finders, though, is that these are also, not to pat my own back here, but these are characteristics of good communicators, and they're also characteristics that you need, you have to model to be a facilitator, right? Whether we're talking about reframing, when we're talking about reframing, what we're talking about is communication, individualization, empathy, and adaptability, right? When we're talking about strong listening skills, we're talking about these same things. So this is not to say that I'm like the best facilitator or communicator in the world. This is to say that these are strengths that I recognize I need to have in my job. And I thought that it might be a useful tool for you to think about breaking out those concepts a little bit. And I know that Donya and Michelle do that in the course. So communication, uh, the responsibility one I didn't mention, because that's just me and my own, like, beat myself. So a, a lot of people don't feel this, but I have, like, an extremely strong work ethic and commitment, um, almost to my own detriment, right? It's my number one strength, and it's probably my number one weakness. Um, the reason, the other reason I wanted to share it with you is that stuff like this, stuff like that facilitative exercise, and the stuff that you're going to do this afternoon, which I won't talk very much about, are ways to be a little bit more introspective, which I think is really important when you're facilitating. Um, I don't know if Donna and Michelle have mentioned this, but when I was in the course, we had a facilitative exercise where like five people started crying. I was one of them, so that's why I feel like I can tell you that. Um, facilitation is terrifyingly hard, right? Because you have to check yourself repeatedly. Um, and I'll talk about that in a minute as I get into the uh, project description. But you really have to be aware of what you're doing in the room so that you can be aware of what other people are doing in the room. Because um, as the facilitator, it's really less important how you feel about things. Um, but we all have feelings about things. So um, that's why I wanted to kind of bring the strengths finders up. Um, also, with adaptability being my fifth strength, I am kind of a go with the flow person, and that can really cause some problems for me when I'm facilitating, because I tend not to think super in-depth about all the potentialities. Um, and what I've noticed from other facilitators that I work with who I admire is that they really take that time to plan, to be mindful of being adaptable, but also to plan out potentialities of what could go. Um, and that, uh, I think partly because I, I am also an individualistic person, I get so into the details that it's hard for me to also come back out to the 30,000 foot level. So um, those are some things that I learned facilitating, things that I've learned from watching Michelle and Danya, um, from watching Diane actually and some of her colleagues. They are, no, she's, sorry, but uh, people who are trained facilitators tend to be able to do those things and I've noticed that those are some weaknesses for me. So uh, rather than text, I thought I'd show you some pictures. This is a project of mine that did not go very well, and I was asked to talk to you about that. So I'm going to start out with one that didn't go very well. I'll tell you about one that did. Um, this is Provo Bulldog Boulevard. Bulldog Boulevard it's, is an east-west running road in the middle of Provo. To the very east at the end of the road is BYU campus. Um, there's a ton of high density housing in this area, lots of students. It's three lanes in each direction. It's a total disaster. There are so many crashes on this road. People don't want to walk on it. They don't want to bike on it. And guess what? It was designated a future bike uh, route as part of Provo City's bike master plan. Uh, how many of you are familiar with Provo government? Anybody? OK. So somehow by default, I ended up doing a lot of work with Provo. I actually really love Provo. Uh, it's very progressive for a pretty conservative place. It's beautiful. It's flat. You can ride your bike anywhere. 
I, we don't want to live there, but I do like to work there. So um, the, thing, the other thing I like about Provo is that the people are really engaged. They have neighborhood community groups that people actually show up to. Um, you have to get clearance from the neighborhood groups to do, to do things with the city, to get permits with the city. So they have worked hard. And part of that is that they had a really progressive mayor named John Curtis, who is now a senator. Senator? Representative. Representative. Um, so this drawing is a rendering of what would be improved sidewalks, a buffered bike lane, so like third south, um, and then two lanes of traffic, raised medians, trees, plants, the whole night. Uh, Mayor Curtis thought that this was a great concept. He was super pro-bike and he pushed a bike agenda throughout his terms as mayor of Provo. Um, so when he, when they first identified this as a concept, he asked us, my firm, to go out and talk to all of the businesses on the corridor and test it. Let's just see how people respond. I don't want to do this to Provo's main business corridor if we're gonna get a ton of pushback. So let's go talk to them. So we did, we went out, we talked to all the businesses multiple times, with some pretty drawings drawn up. We showed them what it was gonna look like. We had two stakeholders out of, I don't know, 80 that were a little upset. So the mayor felt comfortable moving forward with that. Um, we, it took, I don't know, a year and a half, two years to get the money Part in order and we came back out last I don't know the beginning of 2018 and we started talking to people again so we had a um, public meeting in May there's a couple of pictures up there and I, tell me what that body language says to you <laughs> do people like this idea yeah. uh, no so <laughs> what happened right like when we first went out and talked to people everybody was like yeah that's a good idea you should do that and then we came back later and man, we were totally taken aback. And I will be the first person to tell you this was my bad. So when we came back out uh, to have this public meeting in May, we briefed the city staff. We sent direct mail to all of the on corridor businesses. We did in person visits and flyers to everybody on the corridor directly. We sent an email update out to our list that we already had from the concept phase, and we put a post on the mayor's blog, which is actually really well read in Provo. The reason I only have those two pictures from that open house is because about 10 minutes after this picture on the top, um, people were leaning over tables, pointing and shouting at each other about the conversion of a traffic lane to a bike lane. People were shaking. They were so angry about the conversion of one traffic lane into a bike lane. What I'll tell you is that the technical information that we have from the experts showed that everything would be fine. There might be a between a five and a 30 second delay in traffic in 2040 so accounting for all of the growth, right? So on paper, this this makes total sense, right? Why wouldn't you put bikes in on a route to a college campus? Why wouldn't you make it safer? Why wouldn't you reduce crashes? So maybe I'll ask you guys, learning what you've been learning so far, why do you think people then became so charged when we're screaming at each other? Does anybody have experience with bike lanes? <laughs> <laughs> Bike lanes are hugely controversial. I was going to say they're not around, so I, I wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> they, they potentially block access to businesses they do. from auto traffic. That's true. So in this design, we actually left gaps. Can you see this little green box? Provo City literally plans to paint every driveway access green and leave a break in the buffer of the bike lane so that people know they're approaching a conflict point between a bike and a car. So that's very different for Provo. There is, well, one thing I've heard is that bikes don't pay. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. Whatever it is. Exactly. They don't pay the gas tax, mm -hmm. they don't pay the taxes when they license a car. That's exactly right. That is the perception. 
So, so dumb. <laughs> so, here's, so here's what we were really dealing with. So take, take your reframing exercise in mind. What we were really dealing with was an emotional response to cultural change. Yeah. People felt like we were taking capacity away from cars and giving it to bikes who aren't even on the road yet. Why would you give them a bike lane if they're not even on the road? Well, they're not on the road because it's not safe for them to be on the road, right? We know that because we're looking at the technical data that shows that it is not safe for bikes to be there, okay? So what this project symbolized to people was eight years of a progressive mayor who was shoving urban planning down their throats and they didn't like it, okay? So, which I mean, literally, I should have known better, right? I just sailed along because we were busy on other things and we just, we did not stop and reassess the current political climate. So here are some things we should have also done. We should have stopped, reassessed the current political climate. We should have made sure that we went to the new council and briefed the new mayor. Um, we assumed that city staff had done that. Never assume that. Uh, if you're, I would suggest if you are working with councils and mayors or other electeds, you make sure that those briefings happen. Whether it seems necessary or not, it's fine, just five minutes on the agenda is all you need to just make sure you're not gonna get railed. Um, I would have brought in the reach of my direct mail piece. There were people who came to that public meeting who said, well, I don't read the mayor's blog. Well, I don't blah, 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 blah. Um, they were not in tune with the tools that the previous administration <coughs> had put in place because they didn't like the previous administration. So we totally missed that gap, right? Um, we should have direct pitched the Daily Universe and Herald because just issuing a press release didn't get us the pickup that we wanted. Um, and we should have gone to neighborhood councils away from the immediate corridor, right? But because we neglected to catch that cultural change, we really, we really fell down. And because of that, we ended up having to endure two four-hour council meetings, one of which was in July and the air conditioning was not working in Provo City Hall. <laughs> so it was really painful. Um, we had to extend our public comment period by an additional 30 days, which to me is fine, but that was certainly a problem for my engineering team who had an environmental clearance deadline that they wanted to hit. And because we missed that deadline, we held the project for a year. So it will now be building this spring. We did two more surveys, we got tons and tons of comment. But you know what, at the end of the day, 118 respondents, this was an early survey, but um, this was the, one of the ones that we presented to council. We had 23 neutral, 42 opposed, and 118 pro comments. So at the end of the day, the public still wanted it. The majority of the public still wanted it. And at the end of the day, the eight hours of council meetings, council finally approved it. And the main point that council wanted to make was that they should have been briefed about this item. So the, the funding for this project, the technical aspect of this project, everything looked good on paper. It was a UDOT project with federal safety money. The city had less than a half a million dollars in this project of the six million dollars, right? They were ready to pull that half a million out of the city's budget if they hadn't been briefed. So it seemed like things that seem totally innocuous can really catch you if you don't do those assessments, right? Whether they're the big, large-scale formal assessments that you're learning about in this course, or a smaller, lighter check-in period, right? Um, that's why, as Donny was saying earlier, as you move through, you're always going to be collaborating. You're always going to be working together. It's important to go make those touch points again. Um, so that was my not so great project. Um, and here's my super fun project that I really enjoyed. Um, Actually, the Bulldog Project has been a good one. I enjoyed it, but it, it was a good reminder for me. Um, this is Springdale Town uh, and Zion National Park. So UDOT just completed a roadway widening project there in June, maybe. Um, and it started out also really contentious, as everything in Springdale tends to do. Uh, it's a very small community of very impassioned and connected people. Uh, when we started this project, UDOT had basically decided that they were going to re rehabilitate the road from curb to curb. And we had 
a public meeting, not shown here, again, because things got really haywire and I didn't have time to take pictures, uh, because people came in with literally 90 million issues. And I would say 100 of them were UDOT related and the other millions were other issues, right? But it was a public meeting and so they were going to tell whoever it was everything that they needed to tell them. And that happens all the time. So um, by the end of the project, you can see kind of up the top, this is a middle phase. Um, we widened the roadway, we added bike lanes, we got rid of on-street parking, we put in eight-foot sidewalks, street lighting, undergrounded power lines, did a whole bunch of sewer and water improvements, a lot more than UDOT had originally started with. Um, that was a function of um, these people up here. So on your left is uh, Mayor Stan Smith giving our project manager an award. And then on your right is a picture of our project team where we gave them an award the next day. So we started out with literally people coming in and yelling and angry and upset about all myriad of things to literally trading awards for a period of three days with mugs and tchotchkes galore, right? Um, because everybody thought it was so great. I asked them to come back and talk to the UDOT conference this year and the mayor phoned in and we had the contractor there and it was told, we were told it was like one of the best panels we've ever had. And part of that because, is because we tried to work as a team. We tried to listen for those underlying um, I can't think of the term you guys are using. Interests. Just the underlying interests. Um, and also the Batmans, right? What what could be done instead? What If we don't work together and people walk away, what's going to happen? Um, and the mayor realized that, that this was the opportunity to get a lot of the things in that they needed. Um, and he took advantage of that. And he persuaded UDOT to work with them. It didn't hurt that we got a new more liberal uh, project manager who was willing to do that. Um, but we spent a lot of time working on this. We added an entire year to the project schedule, so we slowed way down. Um, after that very first initial public meeting, um, so in that initial public meeting, we pulled out the big sticky notes, which is a great facilitative tool. When you see things happening that, you, that are not related to you, um, we made a big wall. We took two different colors of sticky notes and we said, these orange ones are all UDOT problems. Tell me your problem and I'll write it on a sticky note. And we put all the UDOT issues on orange and we put everything else on green. So they were able, all of the participants who came to the open house were able to look at the wall and see together at the same time, okay, UDOT has this much stuff of the problem and these are all these other issues. Um, and then we, as a UDOT team, helped share that information back to the public. So we said, city, what processes do you have in place to start answering these things? And some of those were in design, were being worked on in design collaborative. Some of them were council related. Some of them were, uh, you know, plan changes that were coming. So we jointly shared that information back out to the list through our list and through the city's list, the newsletter. Um, to tell people, look, here's what we heard. Here's what UDOT can take care of. Here's where we're trying to go. Here's what we're going to do with that information. And here's all the things that the city is working on, which they all already knew because there's only like 200 people in Springdale. And they all know because they're all on committees and they all um, are working on things together. But it's still good to put it in writing and not to assume that people understand. So we formed a community. Well, let me get to my next slide. Uh, so what worked well? We started working with the city really early. They came, they sent staff to every single project meeting, all the way through design and all the way through construction for three years. Most of the time the mayor came, as well as staff. Um, Zion National Park also sent representatives. We slowed down and designed the right project. And I'll say the right project because that took a lot of that considered listening and working through issues and making commitments. Um, we clearly defined where input could be used and then we showed what it was. And that was both with the city and the park and also with the public more generally. So we, you know, the park had, has very stringent limitations on ways that they can operate. Um, and UDOT has very stringent 
ideas about the way they can operate. The mayor actually went to the Transportation Commission on his own and got some money to do some of the things that he wanted to do because UDOT couldn't fund it uh, based on the type of money that we had, right? Which probably wouldn't have happened if we hadn't been really clear about what our sideboards were, right? What our parameters are, how the decision-making process gets done. Oh, I wanted to show you guys that. Um, we had a community working group. One of the best things we did with the community working group was show the technical diagram um, of how projects, UDOT calls it the project delivery network. I'm sure all of you who work in agencies have a flow chart that shows 87 different divisions and who, you know, this step leads to this step, right? And UDOT says uh, just, it's 47 colors, a million steps, uh, and so we showed that to the working group and we said, look, we're up here in this left corner and we have to get to here by this date or the money goes away. So these are all the decisions that we have to make and these are the things that we need your input on. These are the things that we can use your help on. These are the issues that you're talking to us about and these are the reasons why or why not we can't do anything with those and these are the ones that can move forward. So we tried to be super transparent by educating them about our process and then figuring out where there was overlap between their, our process and theirs. Later, as we got to construction, we talked about um, how to talk about this project, uh, which was big in Springdale because the majority of the people who are using that road are visitors. So the last thing we wanted to do was tell a bunch of people, don't come to Springdale, it's closed, uh, because that's their whole economy. Um, so we asked, we had a whole two hour working group meeting where we said, how do you want to talk about it? And we let them figure it out. And I think we came up with a pretty good solution, which was to talk about really broad, high level impacts. And then we got deeper and provided resources um, for people who were impacted more often. The project was built using, did anybody go through this project during construction? What was it like? <laughs> It was a mess, right? There is a mess, but I gotta say, I, I'm on the city newsletter list, and the the the, the way it was like, okay, this is what to expect in the next like month, and you know, we're gonna get to the landscaping. I mean, it was I, I actually was pretty impressed. By the awesome. <laughs> Thank you. It seemed to take the be like, okay, this is bad right now, but they're working on it. It's gonna get better. It, it, it takes the edge off. It right? changes your expectations. So. Yeah. That is that's almost all of what we're trying to do, right? Is manage expectations. Um. And I think, again, educating people about the process is the way that you can do that. So we, sh we had the contractor come in and talk to this community group, and we said, we can build it in one year or two years. If we leave the road open, it will be two years. How do you wanna, does that sound good? These are the kinds of impacts we can experience, expect for two years, and this is what we think it could be if we did it in one. And unanimously, everyone was like, please, one, only one, don't kill us. Um, we also had a person on site and she came up once a week and she was super friendly and really nice and very good at listening and sometimes you just need that person who's standing there talking to you and making those relationships. We worked with existing um, channels of information. They're, the chamber is very strong. Uh, they're not called the chamber but I couldn't visitor the bureau. The visitors bureau. Um, we send a lot of information out. So I think the point that I wanted to make was the reason that that went so well is that um, we really hit all of these, right? We asked people how they wanted to be involved. We made sure we weren't missing people. I was sending emails to 1,300 park vendors in like Germany and New Zealand, and I'd get you know, out of office responses, I think, in Chinese. I don't know what they said, but we were communicating broadly to people who needed to be communicated to broadly, and we were being careful about how we were communicating to other folks. We figured that out on President's Day when the park, we issued, Springdale, UDOT, and the park jointly issued a press release that said, do not come here for this weekend. And they saw a 20% increase in their gate traffic. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me how that works, right? So we succeeded in not deterring people from coming to Springdale. Um, but that means that we were clear in communicating what they could expect and, and how they could get there. Um, so I think that's why that worked. I think the reason that the Bulldog Project didn't work is because we we missed number four. We did not re-examine the climate, and so we missed people who all of a sudden were interested where they weren't before. They weren't interested before because they didn't feel like they had a footing to, 
to combat this agenda. But now, things have changed, and they did. Um, and we missed number five, right? We said, here are all the usual ways we've been communicating in Provo for eight years. And they said, well, I don't get that email. I'm not on the Twitter. You should have sent me an email. You should have, or a letter. You should have personally knocked on my door. Whatever that looked like for them, we missed it. So we should have done that assessment. Um, again, for Springdale, I think we tried really hard to hit all of these, but I think even more importantly was that we were really, really clear about at each phase of the project what we were doing and what we were going to do with the input that we had. So by the end, we were mostly down here, mostly just telling people what was going on, and that was the expectation that they had planned on. They knew they'd had input early on, so they understood what was going to happen. So they were okay. I mean, some of it was here, right? As things got real crazier, we were really impacting businesses. Some of it was in a different place, but we were always very clear about how we were gonna engage them and what we were gonna do with their information. So that is what I prepared for you, and we've got about 10 minutes. Hopefully that did what you were hoping I was going to talk about. Do you have questions? Questions, thoughts, observations. Yes. Can we send this slide to the BLM for use? <laughs> I'd be happy to come and talk to the BLM. Yeah. yeah. That would be great. <laughs> How do you find out the best way to communicate with people in the sense of, you know, you said you had one process that you used for eight years and it was super effective. How do you, I mean, okay, yes, the council changed and the mayor changed, but how do you re-examine like, well, now all of a sudden that's not the right way to go about it. How do you, how do you make the leap of like, we should go knock on doors? Yeah. Like that seems like a big leap from where you were. Yeah, to, it is. To that. Right. So how do you reassess that? So I think had we gone to the council and briefed them, it would have become apparent very quickly, right? As, so that's that same sort of assessment level conversation it would have become apparent because what I didn't know was that three of the people who were sitting on that council were elected because they were sort of talking about coming back from that liberal agenda, right? Which I didn't know, I don't know why city staff didn't, well I do, because they're engineers, so they're not, that's not their wheelhouse, right? That's not what they're thinking about. So it didn't really occur to them, like yeah, they knew there was this political change happening, but they didn't think about it in the context of this one project, right? So that was that was my job, and I just missed it. But you're right, sometimes you get caught. Um, a good way to do that is to always ask who's not here that should be here? Who else should I be talking to? Who else should be at this table? Um, and how do we get a hold of them? So that's why some of the slides I had up here Right? If we briefed the council and pitched one of the papers, those people would have surfaced earlier. Um, if, we'd brief, if I'd gone to other neighborhood councils outside of this, I might have had a, maybe I'd, I would have gone once and there wouldn't have been a lot of people, but they would have come back to me, right? So asking that question is really critical. Go ahead. So after you did the, added council meetings and surveys and public comment period, did you feel that was sufficient like remediation or is there still a lot of like hot feelings so towards this happening? question because uh, we're about to, so this is another common problem with government projects. We've been dark for five months, right? Because they got their environmental document cleared and then they went to advertisement, which takes a couple of months. So it advertised and we awarded a contract in at the end of November. So I don't really want to send out an email the week before Christmas and say, guess what, we have a contractor and we're coming in March because either they won't see it because it's the week before Christmas or they'll accuse me of sending it out the week before Christmas is trying to hide it, right? Oh, oh, maybe that's one of the things I should have told you. Uh, we inadvertently scheduled our public meeting on graduation day. <laughs> so we were accused of 
subterfuge, right? Mm -hmm. Like we were trying to hide it, even though we were literally standing in a parking lot at Provo High School on the corner with balloons and tents and boards and all the things, right? But we were accused of intentionally trying to limit public access. Um, because I, you know, we just were so off on our game on this one, right? We did not do the right assessments. We did not ask the right questions. So that was the date that we picked because that was the date the engineers said they could all be there. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Um, can you give some examples on how you communicate back? Um, yeah. How input was used, and specifically the disagreeers, or like the, the people that you didn't use their input? <laughs> um, so, yes. So sometimes we do like very straightforward things like. Here's, here are the things we heard from you. Right? These are the top, these are the key topics that are coming out in the comments. This we published this. This went out in our email. It went out in the newsletter. <coughs> we briefed council, which is recorded and televised. And then these bullets were used by one of the council members who made uh, or who did an interview with the Herald to talk about it. So we created speaking points based on this. So what we're hearing from people who are opposed to the project is that they're worried uh, about impacts to business access. They feel like bike lanes are not an appropriate use of tax dollars. Um, they don't believe the technical information we have that shows that it won't create a significant amount of congestion. And it's okay to say that, right? People didn't believe it. We showed them all of the technical information and they didn't believe it. And that is, uh, that's a tricky part, right? Um, our, you've talked about this, I'm sure, right? Our inclination as humans is to start explaining. I have a four-year-old, so whenever I say Hazel, she starts explaining. Right? That's just her, it's like how she's wired. She wants to tell me what happened. And I think with technical people in particular, they're like, if I just tell you what I know, you'll know it too. And then we'll all be on the same page and you'll see how logical this is. And human feelings and emotions are not very logical, right? So this wasn't about the seven fatalities on this roadway, right? It wasn't about the, I have a chart with like this huge spike, it's like 153 crashes or something crazy, right? To me, it seems totally illogical that the state telling you, well, I guess that's not true. If the state comes to you and says, this is for your own safety, you're like, is it? I'm not sure right? What do you know about my safety? And in particular communities, Having a government entity come in and tell you what is good for you doesn't play very well, right? So you have to explain those things. So we told them, we, here's what we heard from you. We're hearing from a lot of people that they think this will improve safety, that they want more bike facilities, that um, they would like to see uh, more trees on this roadway. We're hearing from a lot of people that they feel like they would patronize these businesses more if it was a more comfortable place to shop. But we're also hearing from you these concerns. And we just left it at that. We didn't add an assessment one way or the other. Uh, we've used word clouds, that's a nice one. Any kind of visual way to explain that, right, um, is really useful. And then, you know, we also did provide a technical document that said these are the major concerns and these are the technical reasons why. So there was like the short form version and the long form version. Michelle. I'm also assuming that, for example, decreased business access, and you showed us in the picture the green stuff, and that, I mean, not on this piece of paper, that in response to some of the negative comments, you also said, and we heard you, and this is what, how we changed the project, or this is how the project addresses that. So those were, uh, we, th those were in response to the center median. The okay, perception. but I mean, yes. you get the point. Yes. Right? So the some point of the is... things you actually probably did something in response to the negative comments. Absolutely, and that was in the long-form technical document, right? Which is, these are the things that we, I mean, in this situation, it was reactive, right? So it was a little bit harder to say, we heard you and this is what we did, because they had already assumed that would be a complaint and put it in. Um, but you can still say, this is why we're doing it that way, right? This is the reason we that- We anticipate. We, didn't, we heard you in advance. You hadn't even spoken. <laughs> we read your minds. That's right. <laughs> um, but, you know, and the reason that I cramp meetings though is that those are, it's a hot topic and people hate them. Like, just point blank. And so sometimes you will not, it doesn't matter what you say. 
that's going to be a problem. And so you just, you, know, you can throw a lot of information at it, or you can say, you're right, we know people don't like it, but it's, this is the reason we're doing it. I think that's probably the last question. Uh, so this is kind of more general and maybe not applicable to this case, because it sounds like Provo is pretty engaged. But how do you ensure that the comments you're getting aren't just the extremes mm -hmm. and that it's representative of the community rather than just the people who are like, I read this email every single day and look out for the newsletter, and this is what I want to say. Yeah. You have to do a lot of, you have to provide a lot of opportunities in a lot of different ways. So it depends on what your topic is or what your issue is, but um, it starts again with that assessment of who who is clearly and immediately affected or impacted, and who are the peripheral people around the outside. You guys have talked about blaming the five P's. Mm -hmm. No? Maybe, Maybe you, you guys like can it. talk about it later, because yeah. I, I can, I'm literally the worst with acronyms and names, which is great, because I work in transportation. <laughs> <laughs> we only use acronyms. Um, but if you think about sort of the core group of people that need to be, that are going to be impacted and you know it, and then maybe the people who are peripheral to them, um, and then you ask those people who else should we be talking to. When you're talking to, so in transportation, I always reach out to the emergency services and the school districts, right? And they will know, oh yeah, there's this huge apartment complex over here that you can't see because they're hidden in this corner. And the, you know, those are the kinds of things, because they also have issues. The city staff will know their regular usuals, who are the people who always show up. Um, cities are getting better at providing networks for feedback. So tapping into places where people are already communicating, like in Salt Lake City, they have Open City Hall. That's not my favorite platform, I'll be really honest with you, but it is a place where people know to go. Um, but you don't just do that, right? You also use your agency's Facebook page, or you find somebody through your Facebook page who's connected to some other Facebook group and you leverage that. Um, you do direct mail and you do paid ads. You can geo-target ads and do them on the radio, right? Like, you have got to think through sort of the breadth and then look at your budget and figure out what makes the most sense. Okay, so with that, thank you, Leah, for a great presentation. Um, I have a lot of reflections on Leah's presentation. I'll share to connect some dots when we get back in the other room. But one thing I just want to thank you for, Leah, is being willing to be vulnerable, sure. right? To share that, like, sometimes things go the way we want them to, and a lot of times they don't go exactly the way we want them to. And I think what Leah did really well is by saying, wow, we're a little off track right now. What can we do to get this back on track? I mean, that's, it's, everything's a learning opportunity, and every challenge there's an opportunity. And maybe it will be even that much better because it went a little sideways and got back on track. So I just want to appreciate you being willing to be vulnerable that way. Um, we're going to regroup back in our normal room at 11.15, so you have about 15 minutes. And we'll start talking about leadership and getting to yes with yourself. <laughs>